Welcome to the Sober Junkies Podcast, where we go from smack blasting to podcasting. My name's Jacob Neeson. And my name's Sam Rad. And today we are talking to Mike Shank. Mike is a musician who played a role in the 1999 cult classic film, American Movie, which won a grand jury award at Sundance. Mike has played himself on Family Guy. He's been featured on David Letterman. He's a very interesting guy, and we're here today at the Milwaukee Alano Club. And, you know, we're excited to talk to him. So thanks for being on the podcast, Mike. Welcome, Mike. Yeah, thanks. So, Mike, why don't you tell us just basically a little bit about your early life and how you ended up experimenting with drugs and basically just where it went from there, why you decided you wanted to be sober? Okay. Um, when I was, um, I did good in school until sixth grade. And then I was expelled in seventh grade. And then uh, ninth grade, I skipped out almost every day and partied. In tenth grade, I skipped out every day and partied. And um, and then um, and then I just got sick of partying. I don't know. I kind of wish I would have just at least quit partying ten years earlier, you know. And um, I think my life would have been a lot better, you know. I since I quit partying, since I quit relapse, and I was able to travel every state in America and six other countries on airplanes. I was able to tour the Vatican, just be included in all kinds of stuff that my non-sober, non-clean family and friends weren't getting included in. It just was a lot funnier than, um, than partying from my perspective. I don't know. So you think drugs just polluted your life? Yeah, pretty much. You know, it's like almost like a lack of clarity or something where you don't really... Um, see that see that you're, how much better your life would be without drugs until after you quit. You know, it's almost like going to the, the casino or buying a scratch off, and you don't really see that you're gonna lose the money <laughs> until after it's gone. You know, that's a good analogy. Yeah, yeah. So what what was the first drug that you started off with? Uh, we used to skip. We used to leave uh, seventh grade at uh, twelve noon. And we would steal my friend's dad's pot and his Coke and his <laughs> vodka and orange juice, and we'd steal rubber cement from Walgreens. <laughs> wow. And then what, you just huff the rubber cement? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, we'd huff the rubber cement until like a, a, a footstool would look like a turtle or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. That is an odd poly drug combo, that is yeah. for sure. And my mom would be like, we, I'd be at home, and she'd be like, oh, my God, Michael's going to swallow his tongue or something like that, you know. And, and Actually, it's impossible to swallow your tongue while yeah, it's right. still attached to your mouth. So, um, so you've always played the guitar throughout this time, I yeah, think you said my, earlier. my whole life I played the guitar, and, um, you know, I'm a much better guitar player after I, when I'm not high or drunk, you know. I can play like, I don't know if I still can, but I used to be able to play like 60 minutes worth of, classical music blindfolded or with my eyes closed and um if i was high i couldn't probably even play the first song the six minute fuse by bach how old were you when you and your friend uh, made american movie which for people that don't know essentially was his yeah, friend mark. mark basically was in debt and he wanted to make a movie uh, so he decided to make a movie called coven in order to raise enough money to make another movie which right. was titled, what, Northwestern? He never made Northwestern, no, but he did some other stuff after that. I'm not 100% sure what. We've done a bunch of stuff together, um, and he's done stuff by himself. But um, I don't know how much it paid, probably the bare minimum or something like that. That, But, um, you know, a lot of people are, are uh, a lot of people, you look at them and you think they have a lot of money, but actually they spend a lot of money and have a lot of bills and a lot of, a lot of expenses and a lot of maxed out credit cards and student loans and uh, child support and stuff like that. They have to pay that. That doesn't really leave them with as much as other people might perceive them as having. Right. And the, the movie itself is pretty fascinating. So it's it's a documentary about you guys making a movie that actually ended up being a cult classic. I was looking at, at Rotten Tomatoes and it's getting a, you know, a 94% critic rating and a 90% audience rating which is uh -huh. which is quite good and 
I mean, were you were you doing drugs or drinking a lot during when you guys were trying to make Colvin? I was about six months clean and sober when we first started filming. We started we started filming an American movie in 1995, and uh, I got sober August 3rd, I think 1995, when I was 26 years old. So I, we did two years of filming, two years of editing, but I think I was I was um, just getting about six months sober when he started filming. Okay, and I mean, we were talking before this, and you said that at a, at one point you were hanging out with homeless guys and eating trash out of garbage cans. Yeah. I uh, how, did, how did you get to that point? Uh, my mom asked me if I wanted to visit my sister in Albuquerque for 10 days, and I was, I was trapped out there for three and a half years until uh, I could stand on my own two feet, as she said, but um, I don't know. I wasn't really able to stand on my own two feet too well back then because I was still partying, and I ended up in treatment five times in three and a half years in Albuquerque and I was living in my sister's garage and stuff like that and and were you were you forced into those treatments or did you just kind of decide those to go? ones I was forced to knew but by the time I got back to Milwaukee I just got you know tired of um you know getting arrested and put in treatment I got tired of being rejected by my family and when I was partying I got tired of everything and um I just like grabbed the yellow pages and looked up 12 steps or something found a, a, re, a recovery club i could go to you know yeah like this one with that, that we're at right now yeah yeah so what year about was this that was about um i think i was 20 let's see here i think it was about 1995 i've been clean and sober since august 3rd 1995 but I, when I was 26 years old, when I started going to the 12-step club AA, when I was 24 years old and relapsed for the first two years, and then stopped relapsing the day before my mom's birthday when I was 26 years old. Was there a specific moment that you found clarity that made you want to stop all of a sudden? Um, just Because you tried much. for a couple of years, cause like yeah, you said. Yeah, it was just too much unmanageability, and I uh, just... One of my first sponsors says he thought I should never forget how it feels to relapse, and um, it feels pretty pretty sucky to relapse, you know. And um, I don't know. I just I at first I thought no one in recovery really cared whether or not I relapsed, and then I realized he did care, and then I just stopped relapsing um, the day before my mom's birthday when I was 26 years old. Right, and you said that. Prior to first getting sober, you were doing a lot of cocaine, right? I was doing coke pretty much every day for about two and a half years before I went to Albuquerque. And when you relapsed, did you go back to doing coke or did you just drink? Uh, mostly I was just drinking beer and vodka and smoking pot. Okay. So, American movie, did, did you and uh, Mark make a lot of money as a result of that movie? Uh, I'm not so Sarah who paid me asked me not to tell anyone how much I made, but no, it wasn't sure. a lot of money. Okay. No, but uh, I don't know if they made a lot of money, but I really didn't, you know. Right. I, did you enjoy the process of it? Or? Yeah, we had fun because when Sony bought the movie, they sent us on a four-month tour of America to, on airplanes and to three other countries to do Q&As at movie theaters and that was fun. I used to have a phone in my room where my fans could call me at 466 Mike, and that was fun talking to all them people, you know. And you still have that number today? No, I don't have it today, no. Oh, okay. But, um, yeah, I'd get calls from all my favorite fans. I'd get calls from the Packers and other NFL players and um, stuff like that. So it was a pretty big deal then. You yeah, know, I'd get the calls from girls from all over the country <laughs> and other countries too. Yeah, I was reading uh, a piece that I saw on Google that says I, I kissed Mike Shank from from. Yeah, American I saw movie. that. Yeah, I think Jackie found that on her phone, showed it to me. And that was right around, I think, the 10 year anniversary. Yeah, of American. Movie. I don't know. Yeah. Who Who's your favorite person that you, you met during that time? Uh, I don't know. A lot of people I met that were famous were cool. I hung out with Jason Newstead three times. I hung out with Lamb of God. Cannibal Corpse, um, Ripper Owens, uh, Richard Christie that drums on my first CD and drums for Charred Walls of the Damned. I met uh, Michael Stipe from R.E.M. I met 
Gene Simmons from Kiss, Monkey from Corn. Yeah, and what are, what are your thoughts on Gene Simmons? <laughs> well, he's almost impossible to talk to. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, he's, you know, he's, I don't know, he's kind of kind of pretty off the wall there with his, his conversations, you know. So he's your least favorite, you would say? Well, he's definitely the hardest person to talk to, you know. <laughs> you said because he's really arrogant? He, he's very arrogant, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you were at a party, at Siskel and Ebert's party, you told me, at one yeah, point? Yeah, their house one time. We got invited to a party at Siskel and Ebert's house, and um, uh, Mark's daughter, Dawn, couldn't believe that a famous movie guy asked me for a light for my cigarette. Yeah, so, so it's interesting because most of your you know basic fame and notoriety came after you actually got sober, so you had the opportunity uh-huh. to, to enjoy most of it, which is good. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's why I was saying I wish I would have got sober and clean at least 10 years earlier, you know. Uh, yeah, just seeing how good life can get. Yeah, yeah. So, you you were on Family Guy? And would they, yeah, I was would a cartoon character myself on Family Guy. <laughs> <laughs> how was that for you? I that's, mean, that's pretty cool. Yeah. But yeah. And then, I read that you had your own... TV show on, on Zero TV, Mark and uh, Mike. Did that last long? I or was didn't it know just anything a, about that. No, I never had a TV show that I'm aware of on Zero TV. <laughs> really? <no. laughs> okay. It uh, might be out there. Yeah, okay. Wikipedia says otherwise. Yeah, no, I didn't I, 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 not to the best <laughs> of my recollection, no. Okay. <laughs> and then did you do this thing um, where you guys hosted night of the living dead yeah that was like an hour and a half you can watch that on youtube okay i saw it on my phone today and uh, a bunch of our fans showed up dressed in costumes and we had them like uh where they could win prizes and we'd pour fake blood over them and stuff like that and that's exciting played the guitar my ex-wife got to be in that one nice do you have any regrets of doing drugs in the first place then? Yeah, actually I do because I was really good at math until sixth grade. And <laughs> I really, I r- really just, just didn't go to any school at all pretty much after that. And after I got clean and sober, I started reading a lot of physics and science books and a lot of religious books. I even toured the Vatican with my ex-wife one time as a two-person team. We... um rented a hotel a five minute walk away from the Vatican for four days and spent three weeks in Albania together and toured uh St. Peter's tomb and all that stuff it was fun. Nice. But so you like, got you got to be pretty cultured then. Yeah, yeah. Had I had I um not quit partying I probably just would have been dead a long time ago or just really physically sick or or locked up in a mental institution or something like that. You know. Right. And I guess what have you done um for work since these things since uh well over. i've been on social security most of my life for nice. schizophrenia okay because um but had i even got a high school diploma my dad could have got me a job at a factory where he worked uh ppg industries in oak creek for 43 years and um they would have started me out at like 18 50 an hour which was a lot back then right and i could have worked there for 43 years instead of being on Social Security this whole time, you know. And is it? Do they give you enough to to live, or is it pretty tough? Uh pretty tight actually. But right. uh, you know, I probably probably would have made more. You know, uh, a lot more probably working in a factory for forty three years. I guess these days, then, do you find dealing with your your mental health more difficult, or you know, treating your alcoholism? Well, I don't crave drugs and alcohol at all anymore, but, like, if I go without my medicine for one day, people at the club will notice, and they'll be like, did you take your medicine today? And I'd be like, no, and he'd be like, you better drive home and take it, you know, something, you know. Did you notice these uh, schizophrenic episodes before you started doing drugs, or was it apparent after you stopped? Uh, It was it, it was all a result of the drugs, but it, like, lasted way after that you know like if i stop taking my medicine i'll definitely be behaving a lot differently you know stuff you know do you think that drugs like lsd or cocaine or marijuana exasperated the the illness of schizophrenia yeah pretty much i know like when um like i know like when i stopped taking my medicine for a while i was talking to myself over by mark's house and neighbors were complaining 
that I was outside talking to myself all the time and stuff like that, you know. When I take my medicine, I'm perfectly stable. But Look, like this guy's outside of our house talking to himself. <laughs> yeah, this is yeah. bullshit. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious if you would have chose drugs, you know, if you didn't have that illness or if you were just using drugs to kind of cope with this illness. Yeah, I don't I don't know. They well, according to a, a shrink, they would say that that like the way you can tell whether or not someone's mentally ill is that a non mentally ill person can literally like use any amount of drugs and be fully functional and graduate from college and get a good job and stuff like that but a um, mentally ill person would use what they would consider to be a small amount of drugs and act like they're crazy so and the other part of that seems to be that alcoholism itself is a mental illness right and then there's there's other ones that can intersect with it in ways so the Alano where we are right now, I mean, I notice you spend a lot of time here. Yeah. And I mean, do you, do you work here? Or well, you no, I volunteer you here. You volunteer to work? Yeah, I volunteer behind the counter. I just, everyone in the Alano Foundation except for two people are volunteers, actually. Okay. So I get free soda and free coffee pretty much. You know, but I do a lot around here just for something to do. It's a good source of exercise. And then if I'm here and there's a meeting, I pretty much go just to you know, help myself and to help other people stay clean and sober. Yeah, and do do people ever come in, like, off the street that you have the opportunity to, you know, talk to maybe who are, you know, uh, s- still Yeah, lots of, lots of people come here, you know, but I mostly do my sharing inside of meetings, you know. Right. But I talk to people outside of meetings too, you know, but, um, you know, I, I know without the recovery programs, there's no way in heck I would have been able to, go without relapsing for almost 23 years, you know. What other program do you hold to be the most truthful for you? Or what's the most useful of the yeah. of the program? Uh, is it the 12 steps? Is it the social aspect? Probably the, well, the social aspect is cool because I have a lot of friends. And when I, if I told any of my party friends that I was going to quit partying when I partied, they wouldn't want to associate with me at all. So I have way way more friends inside of recovery than I could have ever dream to have an outside of recovery anyways, but just like the just like staying clean and sober itself and being physically healthier and um and mentally healthier is just a big gain for me, you know. So you think that the connection with other human beings is probably the crucial factor in what's helped you live a fulfilling life and not well and no, i just like looking back at my past after i quit relapsing and looking at my past before then there's a a really wide range of difference in in the way you know i was at behaving and in, in the, the things i was able to do and uh stuff like that and, uh, the acceptance for my family and rejection for my friends and Stuff like that. My whole world is way better without the drugs or alcohol. So have you reconnected with your family? Yeah, no, I have a good relationship with my mom, and I have a good relationship with my two sisters that are still alive. I had a sister that was born on Halloween Day that died from hepatitis C but um, when she's 52 but um, and got really sick from partying, too. But, um, you know, now I have a good relationship with my mom and my sisters, you know. Did they, like, welcome you back right after you got clean with open arms? Or yeah, pretty much. Oh, that's helpful. You know. Not a lot of families do that. It seems yeah. like they hold a grudge for sometimes good reason. Yeah, yeah. So, um, do you believe in God? Uh, yeah, I believe in God. At, well, I use God, you know, the God from the Bible as one of my higher powers and the you know, since I toured the Vatican, I use the God from the Vatican, and the Vatican City has one of my higher powers because that's a pretty cool place to tour. And um, wait, so you're you're saying you use the Vatican itself, like just the beauty of of, of the yeah, Vatican? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I I actually decorate my room with like religious objects, so I got like wall to wall and everywhere in between religious objects because I just like to create a, a good environment for myself kind of you know yeah 
Do you find that more important or your friends? Well, friends are important, but both probably because friends are important, you know, but I don't, I don't really associate with anyone who's not at least trying to stop drinking and getting high anymore. You know, I don't like go to bars and parties and festivals anymore where I'm the only one there that I don't really go anywhere where there's drugs or alcohol, actually, if I can help it. Do you have a spirit animal? Uh, I don't know. It's like uh, probably a spirit animal. I don't know. I'm uh, probably. I don't know. I'm. I guess I'm pretty good with animals. I don't know all animals. <laughs> I guess I don't know. <laughs> I mean, if if you did have a spirit animal, what would it be? Like a, a liger? Well, I've I've had kind of weird experiences with different animals in the past. Um, I was in. Fate Magazine, I don't know if you guys ever heard of Fate Magazine, but it's one of my friend Mark's uh, favorite magazines. I was actually in there um, in a Christmas issue a long time ago for something that happened with me and some deer a long time ago and <laughs> stuff like that. What but, happened? Well, um, the woods by my house, it's called Haven Woods, and I, I've been walking in those woods my whole life, and one night I was cutting through there at about 11 o'clock at night to get home and uh the grass is pretty long out there and I heard something behind me in the grass and I looked back and there's a deer following me like 10 15 feet behind me so it gets to be fun I turned around and sat down in the grass and the deer sat down in the grass in front of me at the same time and me and the deer were sitting in the grass looking at each other <laughs> for about 10 minutes and then I got up and walked one way towards home and the deer got up at the same time and walked the other way opposite way back into the woods well the next morning my dad i came downstairs for breakfast my dad called me to the front door and he's like oh hey look mike there's three deer on our neighbor's back lawn they seem pretty tame and i don't know if i ever told him the story about the that deer and two other deer followed my scent from the middle of the woods to my neighbor's backyard in the morning you know so i said man that um article of fate magazine and um they printed it in a christmas issue wow and then one time when we were at the zoo me and mark and chris and sarah who made american movie every time we could get the lion to look at me it would roar and we made a lion roar like 25 times in a half <laughs> hour just by getting it to look at me did the zookeepers get pissed no i they i don't think they're around but um <laughs> and when um, my ex-wife and i lived in bayview everywhere we went we'd see red foxes and coyotes we'd like every time we went outside there'd be a red fox or a coyote nearby so you seem to have some connection with animals in yeah some i guess so yeah a spiritual when i was a little experience. kid all the dogs the lost dogs from the woods used to follow me home too you know <laughs> so you would uh, just have a a trail of lost dogs yeah you. squirrels would eat peanuts out of my hand when i was a little <laughs> yeah. kid you know uh, that's, that's amazing yeah so so uh, i've always wanted that yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. I had a cat when I lived in Albuquerque that used to climb up on my shoulder <laughs> and play the guitar with his teeth, the top <laughs> swing of the guitar with his teeth. Really? Yeah. He only did it one time, but it was pretty cool, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, um, Kurt Cobain's daughter, Frances Bean, in 2014. She posted a video of me playing the guitar, yes, I guess, w- on With the quote Facebook, that said yeah. that you're her spirit animal. What yeah. Do you, what do you think of that? Um, I... Mark's daughter, Donnie, sent it to my phone so I could see it, but I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I want to be someone's spirit animal. Right? Yeah. <laughs> did you get in contact with her? I did. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Did that pull you guys' eardrums off? Oh my Sorry God. about that. <laughs> A little but, bit. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Sorry about um. No, I, I think I tried posting on her Facebook page and her mom's Facebook page, but um, never heard anything back. But I thought it was pretty cool, all that. You know, yeah. my friend Sheree used to be friends with Courtney Love and uh, Kurt Cobain, and she used to party with him, and he, he gave her a ring with a K on it that she still has, I think, you know. Cool. And she's saying that she's still talking to Courtney Love like that's Sheree from uh, Colvin. She's still talking to Courtney Love like once a month. Interesting. What's uh, next for Mike? Well, like how I said, old well, are you now? You're 40, 49. 49, okay. Yeah, I don't know. I put all my effort in, like, just like helping 
other people stay clean and sober and go into meetings and help myself and stuff like that. No music, no movies coming well, up. Well, I play the guitar a little bit still. I, be, before I recorded my second CD, I was playing like nine and a half hours a day for four years, and I used to play like <laughs> so nine and a half bad. hours a day in Albuquerque, too. Grueling. But, um, yeah, there's not much else to do I there. I don't play anymore at all. I don't know, but... You know, so you played a cameraman in a what was it a show Todd called Lines the movie is storytelling storytelling yeah and I was in there with John Goodman and I think it was Selma nice. Selma Blair the girl who played the possessed girl in the movie The Exorcist I think that's her daughter oh Selma wow Blair yeah huh how was that that's pretty cool right you know and you played. I played, uh, I don't remember what my name, my name was. You were just movie, some cameraman? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he had me take a hammer and start hitting this guy's camera with a hammer, and the guy who owned the camera is <laughs> like, no, he can't do that. He can't do that. He's going to wreck my camera. That's an expensive camera. And, and Todd Salons is like, no, it's part of the shot. He has to, he has to hit your camera with a hammer, and the guy's like totally panicking. You know, and Todd Salons is like, no, he this is my movie. He has to hit the camera with your camera with my hammer. <laughs> <laughs> how was how was John Goodman in that? Uh, I didn't. He was in this. We had like these trailer home dressing rooms, and uh, he I saw him standing outside, but I didn't talk to him. <laughs> you know, I saw the part where he acted in the movie. You know, nice. But, um, they don't they don't co mingle when they're on set. I don't know how these things work. Uh, I talked to Selma Blair in New York. We were just sitting down on on a sidewalk talking to each other, but um, I didn't really talk to John Goodman at all, you know. But I didn't really actually have to be on the set except for just like several times. So I was in my hotel room a lot of the time, and um, I found an AA club on the same block as my hotel room. So I got like one of my one of my sobriety coins there actually, and went to the Ended up going to the New York uh, Central Office on the bus with the guy that I met there. Nice. Nice. So I appreciate you talking to us, Mike. I guess before we conclude this, do you have any basic words of wisdom to somebody who is still, you know, miserable and perhaps, you know, eating eating out of dumpsters with homeless men like well, you were and wants to get better? Just that your life would be a, a lot better if you didn't party. I don't know. That's... You know? <laughs> uh, so my life was a lot better after I quit party and I guess you know I mean there's nothing I can do about it now but I I do actually wish I would have quit at least 10 years earlier when I was 16 instead of 26 yeah it's never too late but the earlier the better yeah for sure well thank you yeah yeah I guess we'll leave it there um thanks for tuning in thanks thanks for coming out Mike okay, yeah, yeah thanks a lot Mike yeah, no problem